Um, I'd like to welcome you all to today's event, which has been delivered by IDC Northeast. Thank you very much for all coming here um, today. Um, you'll all hopefully enjoy today's event. Um, the event itself is entitled The Quran, Don't Burn It, Learn It. And the discussion is going to provide you an insight into the Quran itself and the importance it holds in the Islamic faith. Um, we're also going to discuss reasons why recent events such as the Quran burning have upset many people from within the Muslim community. Um, we've got two keynote speakers here today who will be delivering their perspectives on recent events and they're going to discuss what the Quran means to Islam and the Muslims. We've also invited a number of panelists from various or no face who are going to participate in the questions and answers segment of today's event as well as delivering a brief address and presenting their perspective on, on the Quran itself and why we shouldn't burn it and, and the, about learning it as well. Um, before we do get started, I'm just going to quickly run through the itinerary as well so you all know what to expect for today. Um, we're about to start the, the talk itself um, with a short poem delivered by Abdul Wajid, who's here as well. Um, after that poem, um, we're going to have a introduction to the topic by Abu Tayyib, who is the founder of IDC. Um, he, he has actually worked tirelessly around the region pr promoting positive relations within communities and teaching people about Islam and the Muslims. Um, after that, we're going to have a short break at 2.15 where you'll have the opportunity to have refreshments in the canteen, which is directly to your right. Um, and you'll also have the opportunity to observe the Muslim prayer because that will be in conjunction with the prayer time as well. Um, I'll just to let you know about the fire exits as well, we've got fire exits on both the right and the left side um, and also towards the front of the building as well. So if there is uh, an alarm raised, um, the ushers are all here to basically escort people out. Um, after the break, we're going to have the next keynote speaker, which is Abdurrahim Green. He is a former Roma, Roman Catholic, a uh, convert to Islam, and he's well known for, for his uh, amazing work and tireless efforts in promoting positive understanding of Islam to people of a variety of different faiths. Um, guest panelists today will include Alistair McNaughton, who's an illustrious Christian speaker known for his interfaith dialogue and his progressive views on religion and society. And finally, our other guest panelist will be Craig Bankhead from an organization called Shore Race and the Red Card. He's going to talk about the work that his organization does in promoting positive relations, as well as discussing things around Islamophobia and how, how they have encountered things recently. Um, unfortunately, Ranjana Bell is unable to make it. She sends her apologies. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our, to our um, esteemed guest here, Abdul Wajid, who's going to recite a short poem, and then we're going to get on with, the, with proceedings. Thank you very much. Um, welcome. Well, um, I've kind of been drafted in just to give you a bit of an insight, really. But as Muslims here living in the Northeast um, and people of faith, we are constantly questioned and brought upon on how our faith affects our lives. And um, since certain incidences such as 9 11 and 7 7, um, being people, especially of the Islamic faith, we tend to be blamed for everything that's going on. And I get asked a lot, uh, do I get issues, do I get problems, because obviously, you know, I wear my faith on my face, and it's, it's something that I'm very proud of, so it's very much a, an integral part of my identity. So, um, I wrote this poem, and it's called Beard Issues. Do I get problems because of my beard? All of the time, it's true. Ever since I grew into a fist length, I have suffered from split ends. There's a constant need to trim and learn a new products to tame my hair. I use shampoo and conditioner, have to use both, otherwise it afros, looks wild and out of control, and of course, I'm worth it. Once my daughter lifted it up and inquisitively stated, is your chin under there? And the skin here so pale? My friend asked why. Tan lines, I reply. The UV rays lost, no chance of getting through the luxurious mat of my beard. And in the changing rooms, blow drying and combing it through. It takes a few minutes more, and more is the last one to leave. So now you know my problems, my beard issues. 
This next poem that I wrote was um, an incident that happened when I went shopping. My wife doesn't trust me to do that too often, um, for obvious reasons. Being a man, not knowing what, what I actually get. But once she did, she trusted me to go get the shopping sorted. So I went to Asda to do it, which is in Gateshead. And um, on the list, it had all these things, and it said onions. So I thought, great, <clears throat> onions. How hard can it be? But when I got there, there were a whole host of different onions. There were small onions, there were large onions, there were Spanish onions, there were red onions, all sorts of funky stuff going on, right? So I was like, dude, it's proper confused, right? So I was standing there and I thought, you know what? I'll come back to it, I'll give it a bit of thought. And I turned around and there was another gentleman standing there, who obviously wanted some onions as well. And he was right there, and I, and I turned around and looked at him, and he looked shocked, and I looked shocked, and both kind of glanced at each other for a moment, and I sort of sidestepped and said, Yep, I'll be something the onions mate. And I carried on walking down and did the rest of my shop and came back to it. And I thought about what that gentleman's experience was and what his perception was of what had just happened. And I wrote this poem from that gentleman's perspective and it's called Bin Laden Shop Sarasta. I saw him mulling over the loose onions of the pre-packed trio. He didn't look too sure, it doesn't look the cooking type. It's probably for one of his Four wives. He's lost colour. He must be spending more time in his cave in Tora Bora. Heck of a trick though to get the gate set. But I suppose the prices are better, and with all this talk of the credit crunch, wise decision. Undecided over the onions, he walks over to the apples. Doesn't like the classic English apples which are now in season. But I couldn't believe it when he bagged a selection of Washington Reds. America's finest, and then made his way to the Ben and Jerry freezer before making his way to the paint counter. I couldn't believe it, but I saw it with my own two eyes. Bin Laden shops at Asda. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to start in the name of Allah, the most merciful. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for taking their time out to be here this afternoon on this uh, wonderful day in um, Whitley Bay, North Tyneside. Um, I'd like to um, welcome you all to the program today and first of all, I guess, um, give you a brief introduction on what IDC is and what it stands for. IDC stands for the Islamic and Diversity Center, which was established um, many, many years ago. I'm feeling very old um, since it was started, but what we've started doing was um, really to give the Muslims in the Northeast um, a voice around um, some of the issues that are in the current climate especially, to promote that community engagement, to promote that interaction between the Muslims and those from outside of the Muslim community. Um, and our first public event was in 2006, one year after the July 7 bombings. And that was in order to give a clearer picture or a clearer voice of Muslims um, talking about their experiences and what it means to them. And you know, so many times we hear, or I've heard, whenever I go around, traveling around the country or talking to people, that you know, the Muslims, they don't speak up enough. They don't do enough. They don't talk enough. And, you know, the, the media representation, unfortunately, I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, isn't the most accurate. So the idea was to um, give the Muslims a voice from within the local region to talk about topical issues, themes which affect the Muslims and the wider community here in the Northeast. And today is one of those events where, as we know, um, quite recently, September of this year, the, um, and prior to that, in fact, there was the whole talk about the burn the Quran day in Florida, and there was the issue of, and Gates said, right here in the Northeast, a group of uh, men in the back of a pub decided to actually carry out the, um, the Quran burning um, on September the 11th. So we're going to, and hopefully, we're going to touch a little bit about that as well later on. But you know, I have to say that I do find it amazing that even ha after all of that, knowing and the, the talk that keeps going on about Muslims not having a voice, the Muslims not doing enough, I find it incredible, I find it amazing that even an organization like IDC, who are doing such positive work in the community, 
and we have a wonderful team from different backgrounds, different cultures, different ethnicities, all coming together to promote this positive message and this pro um, positive engagement, yet we still find so many problems and barriers thrown in our way. Even for this event, both from the Muslim community and the non-Muslim community sometimes. So it's, you know, I find it really amazing. On the one hand, we are told the Muslims aren't doing enough, they're not coming forward enough, and at the same time, we are getting barriers put in our way when we do, those who do want to come forward and organize themselves and do something positive. But in reality, IDC, we have a strategy. It's not going to deter us from what we're doing. We're still going to come forward and um, promote that positive message and clarify the truth, you know, remove the misconceptions, challenge the stereotypes, and as a result, teach authentic Islam. And that is our strapline, that is what IDC stands for. Removing misconceptions, challenging stereotypes, and giving authentic Islam. Um, and what we have is, we have an organization which, is, which has a strategy to work alongside you know, the mainstream community and promote those positive relations. And we know we're always talking about this big society. There's a lot of talk about you know, the big society that David Cameron has uh, put together. And, we are, and you know what, the, this collective work, this collective, um, the community coming together to stamp out really, you know, some of the bigotry and the prejudices that are starting to become more and more prevalent here, even in the Northeast. So things like the, the rise of the extreme right wing, the, um, the, the, the likes of the BNP and the EDL, and trying to engage them properly and effectively. To, you know, and, I, and you know what, I, um, I'm impressed by Show Racism Red Card, and this is something that I learned from them with, them with the work that I do with them, of you know, that everyone is a victim here. Even those people who join right-wing extremist organizations are also a victim. Maybe a victim of learned behavior, maybe a victim of some other, other forms of things which affect and influence them. But certainly a victim of misrepresentation and misinformation. So, I guess what we want to do is, as IDC Northeast, as a group of Muslims who have organized themselves, and non-Muslims who we collaborate and work with very, very closely, is to try and get the positive message out there of what Islam really stands for, what the Muslims believe truly, and not what the minority who misrepresent our community stand for. Because unfortunately, sometimes we fall into that habit of you know, blaming the majority or holding the, the majority responsible for what the minority may do. And I think that is unfair in any community, not just the Muslim community. So why this event, the Quran, burn it or learn it? <clears throat> or in other words, don't burn it, but take the time out to learn it. Why this event? What is the objective? What is the purpose of holding an event like this? Well. This event is a direct response or indirect response to the Quran burning incident that took place in Gateshead on September the 11th. And to see how um, we as a community are going to respond to that in a non-violent, intellectual and educational way. To try and deal with some of the issues that we see. And in reality, you the audience hopefully will take something away from today's program and um, be able to work with us, the Muslim community, to try and fight and combat some of the prejudices that are prevalent today. So from IDC Northeast and the, and the Northeast Muslims perspective, this event is a direct response to that. Um, also this event, the other objective I guess, is to allow you, the audience, to Break down, we want to try and break down some of those barriers for you to get engaged and hear firsthand from Muslims themselves what Islam stands for, to try and remove some of those misconceptions, to try and challenge some of those stereotypes, and what the Quran means to the Muslim, why the Quran is so important, and why, more importantly, it is not really a good idea in today's modern liberal secular democracy, our society that we live in today why it's not really such a good idea to burn the Qur'an or any religious scripture for that matter. 
and hopefully we're going to um, meet those objectives throughout the program today. So, I think a good place to start would be on perceptions. And you know, all each and every one of us have a perception about something or another. And in this context, our, what are our perceptions of Islam and the Muslim community? And you know, perceptions are usually based upon the influences that are around us, the information that is fed to us. And that's how we form our perceptions and sometimes even which feed our stereotypes. And each and every one of us in this room have a perception about something or another. About Islam and the Muslims, let us look at where our main influences come from. For the average Joe on the street, for the, 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 the normal person or the one who is um, just an everyday person in, the, in, in our society. The reality is, I guess, most of our influences are going to be from the mainstream media. And, of course, not all the mainstream media is bad and not all the mainstream media is inaccurate. But a large proportion of it, certainly, I believe very strongly, that the mainstream media has to shoulder some of the responsibility of the way that the Muslims are being perceived in society today. And they have to shoulder some of that responsibility, if not a large proportion of it. So we know that we are living in an information age. We are living in an age where we have so much information bombarded, uh, we're bombarded with on an everyday level. Now what we have to try and decipher is how much of that information is authentic or unbiased or truthful or accurate or is that information that we are receiving biased, prejudiced, inaccurate and we have to try and decipher that. But you know when we are bombarded with so much and we're living in a time where you know um, um, time seems very short, we're always running out of time. We don't always have time to check our facts and information. And this is where I guess the, the, what we're living in is an era of spin also. And you know, the media, the mainstream media I talked about, and some of the stereotypes that are being pushed. And in reality, the Muslims are not the first group of people to be targeted by the media in this way. And we're probably not going to be the last. That's the reality of it. But you know, some people you might say, um, that we are, as the Muslim community, we might be the new, you know, black community of the 80s, or we might be the new Irish community of the 70s, or we might be the new Jewish community of the turn of the 20th century, in the way that we are being portrayed today. I don't know about that, but I'll let you decide whether you think that the Muslim community is like that or not. But certainly what I can say is that the Muslim community is the second largest faith group in this country sitting at around 2.5 million Muslims in this country residing here and over 50% of them who were born in this country so what I do know is that regardless of the media representation or misrepresentation of the Muslims and the perceptions that people may form about the Muslim community you know we we collectively have to try and deal with and organize ourselves to try and remove some of those misconceptions and get the truth out there. And, you know, unfortunately what's happening now is, and this relates to the incident that happened in September this year, what we're seeing is that many things which are good are being seen as evil or not very good. This is the type of society we're living in today, I believe very strongly. That the things which are normally good are now being seen as not so good for the community. And things which are not so good or evil or bad are now being portrayed as being good for the community. So how do we balance that off? Well, let me give you the example of this Quran burning incident. I'm almost certain whether it's Pastor Terry Jones in Florida or whether these six or seven individuals in Gateshead I'm almost certain that they have not read the Qur'an from cover to cover in the English language. I'm almost certain of that. Because had they read it, they would not be saying statements like, Islam is of the devil, or the Qur'an is an evil book. 
So the Quran, we very strongly believe, and our guest speaker, Abdul Rahim Green, is going to talk a little bit more about the Quran in detail, is certainly not an evil book. In fact, we believe it to be the revelation sent down by God, the one God, through Angel Gabriel to the last Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We believe that this is scripture from the Creator. And the last scripture, because we also believe as Muslims that scriptures were given to other prophets and messengers before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I'm almost certain that, you know, these six or seven people who have been arrested for the Quran burning incident um, have fallen prey to this idea of, you know, these, some of these perceptions that they formed because of the influences around them, maybe the mainstream media, maybe some of their prejudices that they've held against other communities, whatever it might be, but some of these perceptions have been formed based upon that. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the media and the Muslims because it links in with what we talked about with perception and how some people may come to the conclusion that Islam is evil or not a good religion or it's alien to our society, it doesn't fit in, the Quran is an evil book and what is the big deal with burning the Quran anyway? Well, you know, we have to put things in context and we have to look at how things have got the way that they've got. What, what was the build up to the Quran burning? And we're seeing today, you know, in our society, many things happening. We see the representation of Muslims generally being a very negative one, generally speaking. We see in the media stories which are um, sometimes not even related to Muslims at all, but they're being linked with Muslims. We see Islam being um, synonymous with terrorism, with oppression of women, with radicalization, and so on and so forth. But I mean, is this really what it stands for? I mean, where will it really stop as well? It seems like, you know, the media is almost hell-bent on marginalizing the second largest faith group in this country, a community which is, has a significant amount of people, as I mentioned. And we're not even talking about 2.5 million in this country. We're talking about a whole group of people, a whole religion, a whole community around the whole globe of 1.6 billion approximately. Now that's not a small number of people. That's almost one in five people in the world today are Muslim. Why is that important? Why is that an important fact? Because we are seeing the systematic um, propaganda machine attacking not only the Muslims, but a whole faith group. You know, they didn't, you know, we've seen stories of, let's look at the build-up, stories of Muslim women being attacked. The ban the burqa ordeal we saw. The legislation being, in places like Belgium, passing legislation for 30 women who cover their faces. A group of generally vulnerable minority group of people. We're seeing stories like those when the Pope came to, to the country. Five people got arrested. Apparently they were going to blow up the Pope. You know, the, the draw of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, day. All, all this sort of thing, which is a build up to when uh, this conditioning and the sens sens sensationalization of the Muslim community. And then, of course, we had the burn the Quran day, where we have um, a pastor, a small time pastor in Florida, who has a very small congregation, who's been given that, that, that breathing space in the media to sensationalize this one day that he wanted to burn the Quran and um, you know um, uh, read really to provoke the Muslim community regardless of what he says about you know it was only the militants that we wanted to or the Islamists he wanted to attack but so we, we see that um, these unfortunate people five or six people who got arrested fell into that trap of you know the build-up of the, some of the information, misinformation that they got about Islam and the Muslims and then they wanted to express themselves in that way by burning the Qur'an. So the Qur'an, what is it? Why is it so important to the Muslims? As I mentioned, the Qur'an is the religious scripture for Muslims. The Qur'an is revered by Muslims, some in the community who will kiss the book, wrap it up. Why, why do these people wrap the book up, put it on their shelves? Um, 
not taken to dirty places, you know, respect it with so much, um, uh, show so much respect to it. Why is it so important to Muslims? Because in reality, the Quran for Muslims is the book in which we live our lives by. It is the revelation sent by Allah, sent by God, the one true God, on how we conduct ourselves in society, how we place things in its right, rightful place, how we give the rights to our you know, neighbors, our parents, our children, our siblings, and the general community. All of that, those general principles are given to us as Muslims from our Creator, that we try to live our lives in accordance to the best possible way that we can, to be as righteous as we can, and to contribute positively to this society. So what's the big deal with burning it? Well, it's not so much the actual burning that was really the problem, because those who know a little bit about Islam will know that when we, try, when we get rid of our Qur'ans, the ones that are tattered or beyond repair, then we burn them to get rid of them, or we bury them. So it wasn't so much the actual burning, I guess, that was the problem here. The problem was the intent. What was the intention? The problem was what it represents. The problem, I guess, was also who the people behind it, what they represent also. And if this is successful, as in those people don't get charged for it, and made an example of, really, what are the consequences for that? What is the um, precedence that is going to be set beyond that? Is it going to be a green light for everybody to come along and have their pop shot, like, pot shot at the Muslims? Is it going to be a green light to already a, um, a community, which is fair game almost, for people to disrespect in our society today? So really what we're saying is, or what I'm saying is, it wasn't attack, an attack by burning the Qur'an on militant Muslims or radicalized Muslims, as many might claim. Really this was an attack on all Muslims. Why? Because it's not just Muslims who have become extreme who read the Qur'an or live by the Qur'an. It is all Muslims who try to live their lives by the Qur'an. And, you know, I think the other point was to provoke a response, and in particular a, um, a violent response by doing such an action, so that the Muslim community might um, respond in a negative way. And then again they can say, look, this is the community who are very violent, what we are saying is exactly true, because look at their behavior. And I'm so glad that the Muslim community in the Northeast did not respond in that way and responded in a very um, intelligent way where they did not respond violently but tried to respond intellectually. And I guess that the other point is about the intention behind burning the Quran is to solidify that, is, well, solidify that Islamophobia is an accepted reality. That is something which happens in our society. So to conclude my very brief introduction to the topic, um, my presentation on the Quran, is what we're trying to say is, don't burn it, but learn it. Take the time out, you've been given gift boxes, and in your gift box you will find um, a booklet which has selected verses of the Quran. Um, for you to have a look at and make your own minds up whether this book really is an evil book or not. And I think what we need to do as, an, as a group of people, regardless of our faith or background, is to challenge the stereotype, to challenge the bigotry, to speak out against some of those injustices and look beyond the headline, as it were, and to really take the time out to look at whether some of the information that we get is truthful information or not. And this collective work, I think, is going to be um, very important, especially that we are living in um, a, a global village, as they call it, but a global society, which this world really is moving beyond borders and cultures, and we're living in changed times now. So I think this is the, the, the message that we want to get across, is to make that change and to make that difference by working as a collective group of people to understand what the facts are and what the truth is. And on that note, I think 
um, I'll conclude. I had a whole th list about the EDL and the, um, the Quran burning incident, but I think I'm not going to talk about that. Maybe in the question answer panel, I might talk a little, touch a little bit about that. So I'd like to thank you for your time to, to listen to me, and um, we will um, conclude this first part of the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, th thank you for um, returning now. Um, we're about to start again, and I'm going to introduce you to the second keynote speaker of, of the day, Abdul Rahim Green, um, who's travelled all the way from London today to be here. Um, he's going to present on the importance of the Quran to Muslims and the relevance it holds to society today, and also why it is important to learn it before you do make any assumptions about Islam. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum everyone. May the peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. Um, I was traveling up here today from London. Well, I actually didn't actually come from London today, but I came from Rossingdale near Manchester. But before that, I came from London. But on my way up, I was thinking, who on earth would want to come and spend their Sunday listening to some Muslims talking and whinging about how some people want to burn their book? I mean, that fascinates me. Why would anyone spend their Sunday? I mean, I know why I'm here, and I'll, maybe I'll share it with you. If a few of you are going to share with me why you're here today, because I'm really curious to know. So I, there's a gentleman I've been looking at you, looks so glum, he looks so sad. I'm wondering, why did you come here today, sir? Why did you come here? Curiosity. Yeah? Curiosity. Curiosity. Are, you, are you a Muslim? Why not? Okay, and is that, why did you come? Yeah, curiosity, yeah. Curiosity, what did curiosity do? Uh, <laughs> why are you here, Dave? You what, know, what, I, what, I know, I got, uh, just the uniform, it's, uh, why are you here today? Because I was invited. You had to come. No, I didn't have to come. But I was invited and I was... It was politically correct to come. No, no, I was invited and I was interested to support the community. Great, so you wanted to come? Yes, I was quite happy to go, yes. And how about the gentleman next to you? Uh, I, I came here because I, I don't know anything at all about the Muslim faith, and I wanted to find out why you believe in your faith. Wow, fantastic. Good. Then that's a good start. Let me ask some Muslims why they're here today. Let's ask some Muslim women. They do, they do speak, actually. They do have a voice. I, I hope I pick the right one. So... Uh, sister over here, yes, yeah, but she's been pointed out to me, ask this one. Sister, why are you here today? Because um, I think it was interesting to see um, how many Muslims would be supporting the whole issue that the Quran was burnt and, you know, to educate other people about um, what the Quran is about, basically. Excellent. So are you, are you happy with the turnout? Um, Alhamdulillah, yeah. Good. How about you? Yeah, why are you here today? Why did you come? To find out more about Islam and other people's views. Are you a Muslim? Yeah. Why? Because that's what I believe in. That's what you believe in? Okay, that's good. I came partly because my long, long old friend Abu Tayyib over here is a man I trust. And he does good work. He does some really good work. And if he asks me to come up, I know it's because he's made a real effort and it's important to him. That's one reason I came up here. But the other reason is, it's to do with the fact that I really care about this country. I really care about our communities. And I really, really care about how people think about Islam in England. That's why I'm here. Because I really, really want Islam to become part of English life. I really do. I don't, and I don't want Islam to have to change. I don't want us to have to compromise our religion. But I do want Islam to be seen as an integral, normal part of British life. And I don't think that's an impossible dream. 
I don't think it's something that can't happen. Because when I hear politicians and thinkers and people in the media and professors and, and the, you hear people talking about the Judeo-Christian tradition. Have you heard that term quite a lot? The Judeo-Christian tradition? I can almost guarantee, although I have not done a research on it, and maybe I will, that this phrase is a very new phrase. You will not find Judeo being included as part of British tradition a hundred years ago. Jews were not considered part, be, a part of being Britain. They weren't considered part of being British. In fact, they had a status that is very similar as Abu Taib actually mentioned, very, very similar to the sort of almost pariah status of Muslims today. But things have changed a lot. So things can change. Things can be different. It's interesting even that the right-wing groups that we've been talking about, you know, the BNP certainly make an effort to show that they're not anti-Jewish and not anti-Semitic. We, we've moved on from that now, you know. That's what they say. And maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but it's interesting that they feel they have to say that. So I believe, how, how do I think we can make a difference? I think we can make a difference by talking to each other. I think talking to each other is the key. When you, you tend, people tend to be afraid of the things they don't understand. I know it's a cliche, but I think it's a really true cliche that people are afraid of things they don't understand. Because they don't understand it, they're afraid of it. When it's strange, when it's different, it makes anything strange and different makes a person feel uncomfortable. Add to that that it may seem intimidating, threatening. It makes you more uncomfortable. But when you begin to understand, why does a person think like that? Why does a person behave like that? Why does this person do what they do or not do what they don't do? What motivates them? Now with that understanding comes something that I really try to teach a lot. I try to imbibe it into my family and the people who I get to sometimes give lectures to Muslims. A very important word that is linked to a very key state of being, it's called empathy. Empathy means being able to appreciate how another person feels. Being able to put yourself in their shoes and think how they are thinking. Empathy is very, very important. And I believe human beings are naturally empathetic. They are naturally like that. I don't believe it's the survival of the fittest. I don't believe in the selfish gene. I don't believe that what drives us is competition, reproduction, and survival. No. I think the reality of the human condition shows that that is false. How then is a human being ready to sacrifice his life for a complete stranger? Explain it to me. How do you explain to me a man falls on a railway track, and he, there's another man standing with his two kids, the train comes, he die, and this man is having a fit, and another man, a total stranger, dives on top of him to protect him from the train. A total stranger even leaves his kids there. How do you explain that? How does the selfish gene explain that? How does the idea that all we're about is reproduction explain that? No, there's something much more profound about the human being. And therefore, I, I do want to try and explain why the Qur'an means so much to Muslims. And I'm going to do that by also trying to very simply explain what Islam is about. What Islam is about. And hopefully I'll be able to link it up all together in the short time that I've got. Um, first of all, I want to ask you, 
If I say the word submission, just the word submission, what do you think? The word submission, does that have a negative or a positive emotional connection? When I say the word submission, what do you think? Negative or positive? Huh? If I say submission, what do you think? Is that a negative thing or a positive thing? Just generally, if I ask you, just totally honestly, I want you to be honest. Is it negative or positive? Yeah? Huh? It's positive to you? Okay. But I, I think, would you think generally in British society, the word submission, what do you think? Most people would say it's positive or negative. Almost universally, it's negative. I, I believe almost, not everyone, but most people have a negative association. So when a Muslim says Islam means submission, and why, by the way, is it negative? Why? Because we believe that we live in a free society. Right? We believe we live in a free society. So if a Muslim comes along and says, well, we believe in submission, Islam means submission. Well, the person saying, well, you believe in submission, I believe in freedom. So why would I be interested in submission? It's, it's generally a negative thing. However, let's, let's actually examine this concept. And we'll get to the Quran and how it fits in in a minute. Every society, every society throughout history is trying to find a balance between two competing and almost paradoxical, maybe contradictory ideas. Number one is individual freedom. Most of us would agree that it's good for an individual to be free. True or not? As an idea, it would be great if we could all be free to do whatever we liked. True or not? As a concept, we all, the idea of freedom appeals to us. That's why it's very emotive. Freedom, free society. This is a, you know, because we love the idea of freedom. But on the other hand, we also realize that you can't leave individuals free to do whatever they like. True or not? Can, can we leave individuals to be free to do anything they like? We asked the policeman. What do you, <laughs> you can't leave people free to do... You can't, can you, right? There has to be some restriction. In order to protect society, so we limit the freedom of the individual in order to protect society. That's it. But the, here's the question. Where is the limit? Who draws the line? Who says and who decides when the limit of the individual ends in order to protect the society? Where does it begin? Where does this one begin and this one end? This is the big question, right? For many years, I used to go down to Speaker's Corner uh, in Hyde Park in London, and I would give speeches there about Islam. And one of the things that I was often challenged on was the issue of Muslim women's dress. And I was, uh, you know, I mean, in Speaker's Corner, you don't have much room except for rhetoric and, you know, sort of making your point strongly. It wasn't, it's not a place for a subtle, nuanced discussion with someone, you know, you stand up and you have to shout. But anyway, so the point is, is that I was being challenged about, so there was a particular, particularly vocal young American girls you know, talking about Muslim women and the way they dress and this and that and whatever. And so I just, I changed the frame with them. I said to them, okay, I've got a challenge for you. Take off all your clothes and walk down naked throughout the park. So then they stopped. They were quiet. I said, you won't do it, will you? No. I said, I have to tell you something, by the way, that if you did that, you would be arrested. You would be arrested for indecency. So you're not free to dress or undress any way you like. There are still rules in this country about how much a woman can show. And by the way, what a man can show and what a woman can show, even in this country, are different. It's different. I can walk down the street with just my shorts, right, and nothing on my top. If a woman walked down the street 
with nothing except her shorts, she would be taken away. Why? Because the woman is not like the man. There's something different. Now my question is, who decides how much is covered? Who decides how much is decency? Who decides how much we should show and how much we shouldn't show? Here's, that's the really important question. Who makes that decision? I don't think it's necessarily a democratic one. But the point here, and the very important, important point is, no, we do have some standards. They may be different standards, but we have some standards. And we recognize even that there is a difference between men and women. But the point that the Muslim, and this comes to the Quran, you see, we would claim from our perspective that when human beings decide to impose upon other human beings their idea of where these limits are, I think this is right and this is wrong. I think this is good and this is evil. I think this is what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat, what you should dress and what you shouldn't dress, what you should drink and what you shouldn't drink, what you should smoke and what you shouldn't smoke, or whatever it may be. And you leave that decision to human beings. Uh, we believe as Muslims that actually human beings are incapable of making those decisions and getting the right balance. Yes, we can make the decisions, but can we get the balance right? The problem is, is that human psychology and human society is so sophisticated, so complicated. The interaction between human beings is so sophisticated and complicated. Our perspective, the Islamic perspective, is that actually we can't get that balance right. And when we try, we always end up with prejudice. We will have one group of people trying to impose their ideas. Let's take, for example, the idea that we've heard about the media. Abu Tayyib talked about the media. The media is very, very powerful in making you think. Think about it. Why do people dress the way they do? Why do they wear this type of shirt, this type of dress, this type of makeup, this type of haircut? I'll give you an example. My wife bought a dress last year for 46 pounds from a designer. This designer happens to be the person who designs clothes for Kate Middleton. Who you know now who Kate Middleton is, right? Okay, she's, you know, she's going to be marrying Prince William, right? And my wife, now since the announcement of the engagement, my wife's a, a fanatic eBayer, right? She put this dress on eBay. Take a guess how much she sold, sold that. And she mentioned designer to Kate Middleton in her very clever advertising thing. Guess how much she sold her dre the dress for? Take a guess. Huh? No, not that much. But she doubled it. She said no, more than doubled it. 146 pounds. That's, that's a, just... So think about it. How, what made people think that this dress was worth buying? This is the influence and the power of the media. But isn't the media responsible for selling us things? Doesn't most of the revenue of the media come from advertising? And the advertising is encouraging us, buy this, buy that, have this, have that. What does that say about the way we are being taught to think or perhaps not think as a society? It's quite scary if you allow yourself to sit down and ponder over that, those influences. These are the things that are now controlling what we think is right, what we think is wrong, what we think is you know, appropriate, what we think is inappropriate. And I was listening to a program and they were talking about, you know, you always hear about film artists, want, they always want to push the limits, push the limits. And I was thinking, push the limits. Push the, how far are you going to push the limits? You know, before, a ma in film, a man and a woman in the 1940s, they were not allowed to sit on a bed together. They're not even allowed to sit on a bed. And then they sat on the bed. Yeah? And then they moved a bit closer. And then they kissed each other. Right? And now it's 
full-on frontal nudity, and it's, it's there. It's basically pornography. And I think, and they want to push the limits. What's the next limit? Bestiality? What's the next limit? Torture? What's, well, they've already done that now. There's no limits. And this is the stuff that we end up watching. This is the stuff our kids end up watching. And it has no influence. It doesn't affect. Who dares say it doesn't influence and doesn't affect? Why do they spend millions of pounds advertising if what you see on the TV doesn't affect you? Push the limits, push the limits. What, what? To me, it's just incredible. And if you think about it, then there are no limits. And that's why we would say you need a book from God. And it has to be from God. If you don't have your morals anchored in a transcendental reality or in God, <laughs> let's just say, if you don't have your morals anchored in something that comes from God, why God? Because the concept of God as a concept, it's unchangeable. God knows everything. God sees everything. His wisdom is perfect. His knowledge is complete. And it's something, therefore, that should be unchanging, that shouldn't be messed around with. Only God ultimately can have that effect. And if you think about it, if you don't have your morality anchored in such a concept, whether it's the Bible, whether it's the Quran, whatever it may be, if you think about it deeply, you will realize that you have no real morality. Because you can always push the limits. Where is the limit? Who decides what the limit is? If you think about it, there is ultimately no limit. And that's why we believe that it is so, so important. The Quran is not, you see, it's not only, it's not only, you see, today to talk to people about religion, to talk about God, it's also abstract. You know, it's so accepted that, you know, your religion is your own personal thing. And it doesn't really affect your life that much. This is a, such a common statement. I'm not saying that everyone's like that, but it's so common. Religion is a personal thing, as if, I don't know, it's just like some chat you have with God every now and then, or maybe not even that. I don't know what they mean by it's a personal thing and you shouldn't really bring it into public life. But this idea of religion is so removed from what Islam teaches. The Quranic concept, and I believe the concept that all the prophets taught, the, 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 the concept of Jesus, of Moses, of Abraham, of all the monotheistic faiths, is that no, religion is your life. It's not just a part of your life, it is your life. It dictates what you believe is right and wrong, what you believe is good and evil, what you believe is appropriate and inappropriate. And you can't push the boundaries of that because that's God you're talking about. You're talking about God. You can push the boundaries of God. How arrogant is that for a human being, a little human being, we are specks on a planet that is a speck in a universe that is a speck as the, as the Prophet Muhammad described, the universe is like a ring in the desert before the throne of God. Imagine that, a ring in the desert. And we human beings, with our limited reason, we're going to say and think that we know better than God? No. This itself is a type of madness, we would think. So this is very important. The, Quran, the Muslim's life is rooted in the Qur'an. That's where we get our criterion by which we judge. And that's what we believe a truly moral, successful, harmonious society must be rooted in something like that. In something like that. It's essential for successful societies and indeed successful individuals. So this is the concept of submission. And if you think about it, we all submit to someone or something. All of us submit. Think about it. For example, ask the police officer, well, you're wearing a uniform. Why do you wear the uniform? Huh? So you can be identified. Do you like your uniform? Huh? 
the, I'm, I'm talking about the actual, put, let's put it this way. If you walked into Topshop, yeah, and you saw your uniform hanging up there, would you say, oh, that's what I'm going to wear this Saturday night? You know, it's like... It wouldn't be my choice. It, <laughs> who, wore, who wore a school uniform when they went to school? Hands up who wore school uniform. Did you enjoy wearing your school uniform? Do you like it? Huh? Most of you didn't, right? So why did you wear it then if you didn't like it? Why did you wear the school uniform? If you didn't like wearing the school uniform, why did you wear it? Huh? Because you had to. But I thought it was a free country. I thought it was a free country. No, we all do things all the time. There's things that we... And what, okay, so what is it when you do something that you don't want to do because you have to? What do you call that? What are you doing? You're... Huh? You, you're submitting, right? I give up what I want. I want to wear these nice clothes. I want to wear this, but I'm going to give up that because, well, that's the rule. Or maybe you do it Let's think about another situation. Maybe you surrender and you give up because you love somebody. Yeah? I mean, in short, I hope, God willing, that, you know, the sisters here love their husbands. Yeah? And the husbands here love their wives. I'm hoping that's the case. Yeah? So it's normal, isn't it? It's normal. You love your children. You love your children, right? But it's not always you want to give up your day. Maybe you want to give up your weekend. You, maybe you want to play football. Maybe you want to go mountain biking like me. Or maybe, I don't know, whatever it is you want to do. But you know what? You give up some of that time because you love your kids. And you want to do something for them. And you want to make them happy. That you, 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 sometimes you give up because you love someone. You surrender. You submit. You can submit out of love. And sometimes you submit out of fear because I'm afraid what's going to happen to me if I don't do this or if I don't do that. And sometimes you do it because, wait a minute, I just know that's the right thing to do. Now if you think about it deeply, think about this, think about this deeply. Can anyone think of any moment in your entire existence when you are not submitting to someone or to something? Think about it. Your entire existence where you are not submitting to someone or something. You, I, I mean, you can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever you say, you'll think that actually, yes, I am submitting to someone or something. When you're asleep, you're submitting for your need to sleep. That our existence is submission. So what is Islam saying? Think about this. Think about the concept. Or I'm not... I'm not telling you the details, I'm telling you the concept of Islam. If you want to understand Islam, it's the concept that's key. What Islam says is, look, actually, the being that is most worthy of our submission is God. If we submit to someone because we love them, well, God is more worthy of our love. Because whatever we have ultimately from goodness comes from God ultimately. So God is more worthy of our love. If we submit because we're afraid, well, we should be more afraid of God than anything else because He is more able to punish us than any other being. And if we submit because it makes sense, because it's intelligent, because it's wise, well, who is more wise than God? So therefore, the one that is most worthy of us submitting to is God. So here's the question. How? Do we submit to God? How do we know the best way to live our life? How can we know what God wants us to do? How can we love God? How can we express our love for God? How can we keep away from the things that God doesn't... That's where the Qur'an comes in. We believe that that's why God has sent books. For example, the Torah to Moses, and the Injil or the Gospel to Jesus, and the Qur'an to Muhammad. These are all these these are books or guidance from God to teach us how to live our life in a way that is pleasing to God. That is the essential importance of the Quran. That's what it's about. Now, if you understand that, 
as, and as Abu Tayyib said, it's not the actual burning the Quran that's the problem. It's not the burning the Quran that's the problem. The issue is the insult that is intended. The point is, I want to insult your book. I mean, a Muslim would say, as we said, that's actually one of the ways we've been taught that if we want to dispose of old Qur'ans or torn Qur'ans or something, one of the ways we're allowed to dispose of it is by burning it. And it's not considered to be insulting the Qur'an. But the point is, it's the intent. But the issue here is, you see, for the Muslim, that is ultimately as if someone is attacking well, almost the purpose of life itself. The whole foundation on which morality and decency and the idea of right and wrong is built on this book. And someone wants to insult it. Because if you look at the essential teachings of the Quran, for someone to say it's evil, it's an evil book, it, honestly, it really is absurd. Because if you look at the essential teachings of the Qur'an, what is it? Number one, there is one God. This universe has a creator, and there are many verses in the Qur'an that talk about look at the heavens, the earth, the alternation of the night and the day. Look within yourselves, look at the animals. Look at These are all signs that point to a creator. An organized, systemized universe points to one who has designed it and created it and organized it and systemized it. It's a very simple, logical conclusion. And this creator can't be the same as the creation. This is the basic message of the Qur'an about God. There's one God. God is not like anything in this universe. And because God has created the universe and given us life, we should worship God. We should thank God. We should praise God. Because God has power over everything, we should seek help from God. That's the basic message of the Qur'an. And God is most wise he knows what's best for us. And so when he gives us some guidance and says, this is the best way for you to live, we'll try to live that way. If God says, don't drink alcohol, it's not because God doesn't want us to have a good time. It's because God knows that alcohol is going to damage us individually and collectively. I mean, we only need to look at the statistics of what alcohol does, how much violence, how many death, deaths, how much abuse in homes, how many rapes, how much police time is spent looking after people pouring out of pubs and clubs on a Saturday night and a Friday night. Instead of going and dealing with criminals, they have to go and make sure that this person who's so drunk, he would drown on his own sick. So he has to be looked after. Is that a good use of police time? Is that what taxpayers should be spending their money on? People who can't control themselves to look after them? It's evil. Where's the logic that marijuana is forbidden and alcohol is allowed? They're just as bad as each other. There's no particular logic in it. It's just a cultural thing. It's not scientific. So God is not saying don't drink alcohol because I don't want you to have a good time. God is saying don't drink alcohol because this is bad for you. This is not going to help you. It's not going to help you be a better human being. You're not going to be better because of drinking alcohol. You're not going to improve the world and make the world a better place by drinking alcohol. You're not. And it won't make you happy. So leave it. It'll be better for you. That's what the Quran says. And this is the case with everything. God knows best. Okay? So this is the Qur'an. It's this book of guidance, this wisdom from the Creator. And that is what the Muslims base their life on that. God's guidance. So we do our best to follow it. And that is the way that the human being will lead a good and a happy and complete life. And there is a very, very important thing that I want to finish on. Very, very important concept. Is that... The Muslims, you see, we believe the Qur'an is the actual speech of God. You know, in the, for example, if you're familiar with the Bible, 
then you'll know, for example, about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is actually God saying, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. Here is, it's almost as if you could put God in parenthesis. You could say, this is God clearly saying something. Muslims believe the Quran is like that. It's actually the speech, it's God talking to us. It's God actually talking to human beings. And therefore, that is something very precious. That is something we have to hold in the highest respect and highest esteem. Because when we respect it, when we hold it in the, that high esteem, that will ensure that we have a very positive attitude towards acting upon it. That's the wisdom behind that. I always remember a friend of mine from the Arabian Peninsula, from actually Dubai. And when he came to my house, if he ever saw the Quran underneath any other book, he would, put it, pit it, he would pick it up and he would put it on top. And I would say to him, Jamal, is that Islam? Does Islam say it has to be like that? Is it, is it forbidden? Is it a sin to put other books on top of the Quran? He said, no. He said, it's not a sin. He said, but I just don't like, you know, he didn't like the concept in his mind that any book should be above God's book. Because what God says is, it's just, you understand, it's a linking, it's a concept. The concept that what God says is more important. Put it on top. It's this, it's this connection between what you do with your body and what you feel in your heart. There's a con and by the way, this is, I mean, it's so fascinating if you study psychology and many of the, uh, the research that has been done now into human behavior, this is exactly what they've discovered. There is this very powerful and strong link between your physiology, between how your body is and your state of mind. So even for example, try this, just try it. Totally aside from our conversation, just something to, you know, if you're feeling down, you're feeling a bit depressed, just try this. Make yourself smile. Just make yourself smile. Yeah? Make yourself move like a happy person. Happy people are jolly and they move around and they smile and they're like this, right? And force yourself to be happy and jolly. And you know what you'll find? You will start feeling happy. It's, by the this is a fact that they found. If you behave in a certain way, you will start to feel that way. This is very important. Okay, and I think if you think about that, then you can see why treating the Quran respectfully is very, very important for Muslims. Because the, the way that we physically treat it respectfully is making a link in our mind between the status that we give what this book says in our life. And that, as I said, is what the life of the Muslim is based upon. And it is not religion as you may think of it. It is really a way of living. It's really what our life is about. It's this communication from God to all mankind. And also, by the way, Muslims don't believe the Quran is just for Muslims. We believe it's for everybody. It's a book for all mankind. The Prophet Muhammad is called Rahmatul Alameen. He's a mercy to all, not even the mankind only. Every single living creature. The book is supposed to be the Quran, a book of mercy. You know what? I'm going to finish on something I think is very simple, but immensely profound. It's profound for me personally, and I think it's profound generally about the Quran. Every single chapter of the Quran, every, there's 114 chapters in the Quran, right? Every single chapter of the Quran, except one, except one, every chapter begins with this phrase, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim which means in the name of God. Allah is not <laughs> the Arab God or the Muslim's God 
Allah is just the Arabic name for the one God who has created everything. If you open a Bible in Arabic, guess what they call God in the, in, in the Christian Bible, in Arabic? God is called Allah. Christian Arabs call God Allah. Jewish uh, Jews who speak Arabic, they call God Allah. It's just the Arabic term for God. Like Dieu in French or Gott in German. So, Bismillah, in the name of God, the one God, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And what do those two words mean? Ar-Rahman, these are the two names of God. Ar-Rahman is the merciful. Yeah? And this mercy is a type of mercy that has some conditions to it. The Rahma or the mercy of God, God is merciful to all the creatures. But if we disobey God, if we immerse ourselves in disobedience to God, if we constantly behave in a way that degenerates ourselves and our communities, then this Rahma, this mercy is taken away. And it, it's, it's exchanged with punishment. So we wouldn't say that God's mercy is absolute in that sense. No, God is merciful to the, those who take the path of seeking God's mercy. But Ar-Rahim also means merciful, but it's a different type of mercy. It's a constant mercy. Ar-Rahim is a, is a mercy that is constant and is always flowing. And that mercy, as the scholars explain, are for those people who are immersed in that connection with God, who are immersed in living their lives and trying to live their lives in a way that is connected with God. When they live like that, even if they go off till now and then, no, still that is a constant mercy of God. So how could anyone, looking at the Qur'an, seeing at the top of every single chapter, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman, the merciful, the mercy giving. How could we say that the Qur'an then is a, you know, a violent book, an evil book? A, 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 no, it's, it's about mercy. God is about mercy. God is about love. God is about forgiveness. God is about repentance. These are the themes that come up again and again and again in the Qur'an concerning God. And those are also the qualities that Muslims should imbibe into their life. And that is also the quality, my brothers and sisters, I have to say to you, because since most of us are Muslims, that is also the quality that we need to display to others, to people who are not Muslim. Where is the quality of mercy? Where is our mercy? Where is our forgiveness? Where is the overlooking of faults? This is the qualities that Muslims should have. These are the qualities that we found manifest and imbibed in the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. Who was the, his character was the Qur'an. He was the walking Qur'an. And what was he? You find he was so merciful, so forgiving, so kind, so compassionate, this is the example that we need to follow. This is the path that we need to tread. Thank you very much for giving me some of your time, allowing me to share a little bit of my vision. I hope that in some way we've come to a little bit of a closer understanding of the basic concepts of what Islam is about and why the Quran is so important. May the mercy and the blessings and the forgiveness of God be with us all. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. As I begin, I'm reminded of some words from a Christian hymn, which I suspect, tell me, rightly or wrongly, could be applied to the Quran as well. Father of mercies, in your word, what endless glory shines. God's endless glory shines in his written word. Uh, that would be how Christians certainly would see their scriptures. But even as a human be ordinary human being, uh, I would feel revolted and disgusted at the thought that anybody should seek to rubbish or to denigrate uh, 
the scriptures of any religion, whether it is the Quran, whether it is the Bible, whether it is the written scriptures of other faiths again. The word insult was used by my colleague and brother just now, and I think insult is the word. And if people insult those things which are really deeply important to us, uh, it is a very sad and unfortunate thing. Another thing that struck me in the context of burn or learn, turning it round another way, I was reminded of the days long before I was born, back around 14, 1500, when the only version of the Bible available in England was in Latin, which meant that the ordinary people could not understand what were supposed to be their scriptures. Only the priests could read, and they then would teach. Well, cutting a very long story short, there was a campaign to translate the scriptures of the Bible, Old and New Testament, into English. And the translation was done, I think, in Holland in the end, because it was made illegal to do that in, in Britain. But when the first English Bible, that is, Bible translated from Latin into English, came out, there were two men behind that publication, a Mr. Latimer and a Mr. Ridley. And the Nicholas Ridley, uh, he, same family, you may have walked along Ridley Place in Newcastle. Anyway, Nicholas Ridley was of the same Ridley family, and so furious were the then church authorities about the Bible being made common and vulgar and translated into the ordinary English language that these two, Latimer and Ridley, were burnt alive in one of the main streets of Oxford, Broad Street, and to this day there's a martyr's memorial where they were burnt. And as he died, Bert, uh, Nicholas Ridley said, with this fight... He, he turned to his colleague, Latimer, and he said, with this fire, which we light, that is their own bodies, the whole of England will be set right. What they meant was that the scriptures, as they were made available to ordinary people, would change lives. As to the holiness of God's scriptures, uh, long before Christ came, many Jewish people were coming to the conclusion that the Jewish law, the word of God in Jewish terms, was so holy, so special, so full of wisdom, that it was like a heavenly being, something there in the heavens, which needed to come down to earth in our own hearts. But how are Christians about this business of if somebody, let's say, burns a Bible? Now, to be honest, as with uh, Islam, there are different approaches, different schools, different schools of thoughts. Some Christians will be utterly scandalized or be out there in the street with placards. The same when other Christian symbols are damaged. Other Christians might take the line, well, God is so great. If people are stupid enough to abuse the scriptures or abuse Christian symbols, well, then they are just stupid because the Spirit of God is greater than that. I don't know how you relate to this verse from the New Testament, from a letter which is called to the Hebrews. And there's a phrase there, which speaks of God's message. And I suspect that some of you might feel it was true of the Quran as well. That the word of God is like a sharp blade. Now these aren't meant to be terms of violence. It's meant to be picture language. The word of God is like a sharp blade, two-edged two blade or two-edged sword. It goes right to the point where bone and marrow meet. In other words, the Word of God 
is so relevant to our lives that it cuts into our lives at the very points where we can't even understand ourselves. And God's word explains his purpose, explains the world, explains how we tick as human beings. So the word of God, many Christians would believe, is so powerful in itself, with or without the actual page, because after all we can re read, read it et electronically now, the word of God itself is so powerful, goes right to the root of things. A final thing, really, that I note in these days, tolerance has been very fashionable in Western Europe for many decades. But one thing that Muslim people and Christian people and perhaps people of other faiths again have been noticing in the last few years is that the world needs to take notice. Some of us have basic commitments which are bigger than the commitments to our government or the people we live among or maybe even than our families. That the commitment to God and to his message is something we won't move on. So it's not a matter of tolerance as we must tolerate everybody. There are some things that are absolutely fundamental and we won't budge on. And this matter of what is God's word as a Christian, I believe, is very fundamental. Every morning, almost every morning, I read the New Testament in Greek and in English, and I examine very carefully the different words and the different nuances. And I find the whole thing very exciting, and it gives me power, I think, power for living and meaning in my life that I want to share with others. So I would never want to part with God's word. I'm certainly very uncomfortable about seeing it abused, because I believe that God's word, rightly expressed, really does change lives for good. Praise God's name. Amen. Hi, my name is Nora Pidcock and I work for Shaw Racism, the Red Card. I'm actually an anti-racism education worker, so I go around schools in the North East um, and in football clubs, just doing workshops on various things um, to do with racism. I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to like, who Shaw Racism, the Red Card are really, for those of you who don't really know who we are. Um, it was set up in 1996 by a man called Jed Grebby. Um, and really, it was born out of a frustration that Jed Grebby felt every time he went to St James's Park. He, he, he heard racism from both the home and the away fans to black players on the pitch. And as we know, throwing, throwing bananas, selling bananas even outside the Newcastle and, and, and um, Stadium of Light as well. So Jed thought, well, you know what, I don't really want to hear this when I'm going to watch football. You know, he had black friends. Um, I want to just enjoy a football match. Surely there's something we can do about this. Um, and, and it's actually expanded from there. Our patron, Shaka Hislop, just to tell you a quick story about him, he was at a petrol station filling up his car um, with, with petrol. And um, at the time, he was the Newcastle United goalkeeper. Um, and he heard like, all the shouting from behind him. You black this, you black that, go back to where you come from, what are you even doing here? Like, turn around, turn around. So he, he did turn around after he finished um, filling up his, his car with petrol. And as he did so, the young lads at the time went, Ah, oh, Shaka! It's Shaka! Oh, and ran over and was like, Come have your autograph, Shaka! Come have your autograph! You're my hero, you're my hero! And he was like, one second ago, I was a black this, black that, and now, because I'm a footballer, you want my autograph. Um, he didn't give those young people um, his autograph, and, and I think quite rightly so, because he was really, really hurt. But it just shows you the role model status of footballers and trying to get across this message of anti-racism. And, and we use that in, in our campaign now. Um, in the workshops that we do, we have um, ex-professional footballers like Dean Gordon, Olivia Bernard, Curtis Fleming, Gary Bennett, and they come into the classrooms and just share with the young people some of their experiences of racism. It's really, really powerful because I could go on all day about how awful racism is and how much it hurts people, but actually coming from them is really, really effective. Um, 
in the workshops that we do, we'll have like a range of workshops starting from um, like what is racism, what are the four reasons why people would get racism, what actually happens to people when they get racism, kind of moving up to more complex types of racism towards um, asylum seekers and refugees, gypsy, Roma and traveller people, and then of course our Islamophobia workshop, which is direct anti-racism work against Islamophobia. Now in the Islamophobia workshops that I deliver, um, we do an activity called One Word, um, and I write Muslim up on the board, um, and I just, I ask the young people, you know, be really, really honest, what is the first word that comes into your head when you hear the word Muslim? And I, I really do beg them, you know, be honest, don't be worried that I'm going to be like, you know, you're racist, just, just be free and say what actually comes into your head. Now, um, the young people definitely are honest, um, and usually, because we write up on the board all the words that surround the word Muslim, and usually they are words like um, bomber, terrorist, um, turban, um, and, and then racist words like Paki, and this is consistent in every single classroom around the North East, um, and in schools that we've done in Scotland, and the South East of England, and in Wales, this is consistent. So then we go through a whole range of activities, you know, kind of exploring stereotypes, questioning these young people, where do you get your information from? Um, I also ask the young people, you know, have, have you ever met a Muslim person? And resoundingly, the answer is, is no. Never ever met a Muslim person. Um, and so I'm like, okay, so you have all these things, you know, that all Muslims, all 1.6 billion Muslim people in the world are terrorists. You've never, ever, ever met a Muslim. And just start to question, well, how do you actually know? What would you say if, um, you know, I brought my best friend here who's Muslim, who never, ever has caused any harm to anyone? Are they part of that all? So it, it's questioning like that, and it's absolutely about being non-judgmental with these young people. Because actually, the young people that I've met, especially the ones, you know, who all have more complex issues, you know, they might be in prison. In fact, I was in a prison, um, about three weeks ago with some young people talking about similar issues and the key there isn't isn't saying to these young people you know you're racist and it's not about labeling these young people as racist but it's about exploring with them and asking them and really question the information that they hear is it really reliable if it comes from the daily mail is it really reliable if it comes from the sun is it really reliable if it's just a rumor that you've heard from one person are you fine then to take that out on that one Muslim person in the street because of those rumours? And, and usually the, the young people really start to say, okay, well actually no it's not. And when we ask them to try and empathise you know, with how, how um, badly young people are represented or criminals are represented in the newspapers, they really say that actually we need to start questioning these stereotypes. All Muslims can't possibly be terrorists. It's, it's not actually possible. And, and they, they do start to definitely come round to the idea that, um, that, that they need to question themselves. So trying to capacitate those young people with the skills to critique things that they hear every day is much better than to say you can't say this, you can't say that. Um, I am not an expert on Islam at all. But what I can do is try and arm with young people to question the things that they hear. Um, at Show Racism, the red card, we do not believe that anybody is born racist at all. We, we, we do believe, however, that it's something that's created um, through rumours, through myths, through stereotypes. Um, time after time, when I'm in schools with teachers, they say, is, is it all right for me to sing Barbar bar Black Sheep? Am I all right to call it a blackboard? Am I allowed to order a black coffee? And I'm like, of course you are. Like, saying black as a descriptive is absolutely fine. But people are petrified of being called a racist. And this kind of makes people angry. You know, you know if you're a well-intentioned person, um, you don't want to be labelled a racist, so you'll do everything that you can not to, to be called a racist. But this kind of co causes resentment in people. Um, those myths are absolutely myths. Never has there been a banning on the song Barbara of Black Sheep or a banning of Black Coffee. But you see how these myths, whether it's about Muslim people, whether it's about gypsies, whether it's about 
can I order a black coffee? These myths are all creating to the problem of um, people feeling disengaged and angry. And actually, the young people that I work with, especially, as I said, the more complex young people who've got, had complex lives, really difficult lives, they haven't got many opportunities, they are impoverished, they're really, really angry. Really angry at gypsies, at Muslims, at asylum seekers. They don't know why, really, but they're really, really angry. And we say to these young people, do you know what? It is absolutely fine to have anger. It's absolutely fine to be annoyed because you can't get a job. But is it really an asylum seeker's fault when it's actually illegal for asylum seekers to work? Is it really that Polish person's fault? Or is it the employer's fault who actually is trying to make more profit? So it's about busting these myths. Telling them, yes, it's absolutely fine to be angry, but is that anger going to take you from where you are to where you want to be? Or is it actually going to hinder your life even further? Is it going to make you um, go on this downward spiral? I do have to say that um, it is a privilege to work with these young people. And there's been some real, real shifts in attitude. Um, one young person, actually, we gave them the, the same activity. Um, you know, what are the first words that you think of when you say the word Muslim? And then um, by the end of the lesson, he came up and he was like, Hey, yeah, Laura, I honestly can't believe I put that word up there. And I was like, you know, being part of something like that, being part of a tangible shift in attitude is really, really a privilege. Um, just to, to finish off, I do believe that challenging racism, especially Islamophobia, which is, the, you know, the new form of racism in this country right now, um, it's a journey. We don't say to young people, right, you know, you'll have this workshop and then you won't be racist or um, you'll, you'll have this workshop and you'll never, ever, ever, um, you'll never, ever think a racist thought or, or you'll challenge every racism that you see. But actually just questioning the prejudice that we have, we all have, um, and the stereotypes that we all hold is taking yourself out of that problem of racism. It's actually contributing to, to a better community for everybody. So I thank you um, for letting me speak here today, um, and I, I hope you, you have an enjoyable afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And I'm going to give one example. You know, the nine to five working day, um, especially during the winter, many of the prayers falling this time, and many Muslims find it hard to, you know, get time for the prayers will find themselves in instances where they might have to pray, you know, in public, for example, maybe in a park. And critics of Islam will say, look, this isn't necessary, and um, they're outcasting themselves, and they're not making an effort to fit, fit inside society. This is just one example. Um, I just want to ask your opinion on what we can do as Muslims to um, make ourselves fit more into society. Is there anything we're doing wrong, do you believe? Yeah. Thanks for the question, Bob. Um, yeah. My kids, when they went to, well, some of them still are at primary school, but um, this issue came up of the prayer time in winter. In summer, it's quite easy for them to go to school and come back and pray at home and still pray within the time but obviously in winter you can't do that so I said listen you, you have to pray you don't have a choice you're a Muslim you have to pray but they said well there's no way to pray so you can pray in the playground you can, pr you can pray there because you can pray as a Muslim anywhere except in a toilet you, uh, in a slaughterhouse you can pray just about anywhere so I told them what you need to do is just find a nice corner in the playground and just say your prayers. And that's it. Well, the first day they didn't do it, so I had another go at them. And the second day they did it, and they just got used to... You see, the thing is, what's the problem, brother, really? Yeah? Is the problem that British society doesn't let Muslims take time to say their prayers? No. The problem is with us. Right? The problem is that 
you feel shy to put a prayer mat next to your desk and pray. I don't mean you specifically, bro. You understand what I'm saying, yeah? But that's the problem. I don't think the problem is, is with British society. I don't think the problem is with uh, British people, right? And how long does the prayer take? Five minutes, right? You don't have to say a long, long prayer. Just do your fard. How long does it take? Yeah? So I don't think that it's a problem. I don't think these things are an issue, right? You know what becomes an issue and a problem? It's when we start demanding special treatment, yeah? I need a separate room in order to say my prayers. Do you? Is that what Islam teaches? Right? I need special time off in Ramadan because I'm fasting. Do you? Is that what Islam teaches? You see, sometimes, unfortunately, because we ourselves as Muslims don't feel confident about ourselves, we don't practice our religion, it's just not natural for us sometimes, yeah? Then we try to impose upon other people some things that, you know, I need this special dispensation when I don't, yeah? Now, I don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's a very healthy attitude. We just have to get used to, look, if you just pray next to your desk, sooner or later, people, and I know people who do it, and sooner or later, it just becomes a normal thing. Everyone just accepts it like it's normal. It doesn't become strange, it doesn't become weird, it just becomes, oh, that's what he's doing, he's just praying. Yeah? So I don't think, brother, really, that there are problems. I don't really think there are issues. You know? The problem is, you know, <laughs> I don't want to go on too long because we've got to give everyone else uh, an opportunity to speak, yeah? But very briefly, and I'm, 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 I'm apologize about generalizing, this may not apply to all of you, right? But this is some, it's a generalization about Muslims in this country, yeah? <clears throat> and this is what my wife told me. My wife, her family's originally from Pakistan, yeah? She said, look, when our people came to England, in the 1960s, 1970s, right? What they saw around them in terms of the culture of people was so alien and so against many of the things that Islam teaches, like drinking alcohol and having girlfriends and having boyfriends and free mixing and all that type of stuff, yeah? So the reaction was to isolate ourselves, to protect ourselves. And so Muslims began to form these isolated communities where they began to try and reconstruct something from back home. Yeah? A feeling of that atmosphere back in the village or wherever it was or whatever it is, you know, the town in Bangladesh or Pakistan. Even down to the architecture of the mosques. Even building mosques that look like the mosques back from you know, from back home. Now, that's not, in my opinion, that's not a very good approach for Muslims to take. And I always ask Muslims to, to think the other way around, yeah? I say, what, how do you feel if you're in Pakistan, for example, right? And you go to Murri, there's a town in Pakistan called Murri, and you see right in the middle, right and smack in the middle of the town, an Anglican, it looks like a church that's been taken from rural England, yeah? An Anglican church and planted right in the middle of the town. There is one. It looks, it looks like a church from the rural countryside here in England planted right in the middle of the town. How do you feel about it? Everyone unit said we don't like it. So well, why would you think that English people would like you building mosques that look like they've been taken from? Do you understand? If you don't like that, why would they like this? And I think we've never really thought about that. We've never really thought about, you know, there's nothing in our religion that says you need a dome, you need a minaret, you need this thing shaped like this to look like that. There's nothing. That's not from our religion. That's culture. Yeah? So there are some things that we can do as Muslims, yeah? Not to make Islam look so alien, right? There are things we can compromise on 
That's not to do with Islam. The things, of course, as Muslims we shouldn't compromise on are things that are basic parts of our religion, like praying five times a day, fasting, Ramadan. You know, there's some basic things like that. We can't compromise on that. That's an essential part of our religion. The things that we need to really think about are the other things. Yeah? Is this really religion or is this culture? Is this helping us to coexist in the community or is it creating alienation? We do have our part to play. And I don't think as a community we Muslims have thought about it enough. Yeah? Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, I've got a question actually. Um, what does Muslim stereotyping mean? And what does it actually say in the Quran about stereotyping? And uh, secondly, uh, what is there to fear about the Quran? Can you please uh, answer this? What's there to fear? Or is there to fear? <coughs> What's stereotyping? And when I was talking about Muslim stereotyping, it was very much from my experience of work with, with young people. And so it's kind of one perspective. And a Muslim's perspective of stereotyping would be obviously very individual and, and maybe different. And, but the young people that I come across, their stereotype is it's really, really kind of simplistic in the sense that it's and it's drawn in from all over the place. So headlines about and um, terrorism will be one. And um, a turban is another common misconception that Muslim people wear turbans. And um, they also talk about prayer mats and they talk about and um, you, you can't eat pig and things like that. And, and so it's all very much and um, it's not really informed some of it. And as I said before, I'm definitely not um, a, an expert on Islam. But if I could just talk about the danger of stereotyping, is that if young people do actually think that all Muslims are terrorists or um, all um, have heritage from Pakistan or, or whatever, um, then that kind of, the journey that they take off, they harbour that inside and nobody ever challenges them and says, well actually, there are Muslims in pretty much every, every single country in the world and not every woman chooses to wear the hijab, some do and it's a choice um, and forced marriage is another stereotype that comes up um, so we talk a bit about that, trying to dispel the myths about that um, but if they, take, if they take that stereotype and, and it just carries on, it perpetuates when they see someone or a lady um, maybe wearing a hijab or somebody who just isn't white who they presume to be Muslim, and um, all these feelings, you know, the stereotype, um, can sometimes provoke anger, and, and then, you know, that's why there's, um, in our Islamophobia DVD, there's a, a, a story of a guy called Shazad, who lives in Glasgow, and, and it was, I think, four days after the 7-7 the seven, seven bombings, um, and he was sad, he was, um, like really, really brutally sad. He had the skull all the way down his side and on the back of his head. And, and they were saying to him, you happy, you terrorist, get out of this country. And he was in Scotland. He was Scottish, he was born in Scotland. It had absolutely nothing to do with anything that happened in London. But that stereotype was very, very um, strong in those people's minds who were really, really angry about what happened in London and took it out on somebody who they perceived to be Muslim. He actually wasn't Muslim either. And um, also, we believe that it shows me from the record, you don't just wake up one day, you know, right, you know, now I don't like Muslim people. It's definitely a process. It's becoming racist is a process. Maybe you've had a bad experience with someone who was Muslim, but that is one person and they should not represent the whole 1.6 billion people. Maybe you, um, Maybe you are angry that, that maybe a mosque has been built in, in, in your town. Maybe you're also angry for millions of other reasons. Maybe you haven't got a job or um, you know, you, you're just unhappy. Um, and, and then that can, can culminate with the stereotype, with the burden of the really simplistic and um, sometimes racist media. It's all a mixing pot for somebody to take it out and, 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 and maybe attack someone for being Muslim. So stereotypes. They're normal, they happen all the time, but they definitely need to be questioned. 
because usually the wrong with me, not every English person eats fish and chips every single night, you know, and um, I do maybe eat a bit too much, but um, not every Scottish person walks around in a kilt and eats haggis. You know, they, they, they're often wrong. Most of the time they're wrong, and they leave no room for individuality, um, which is unfair. Hi, you all are, so I guess I'm lucky. Uh, I've worked with Muslims and lived with Muslims for about 45, 50 years uh, and suffered some of the same problems that you suffered from the English community. One of the things that I'm really pleased about today is that you, I was invited here by my Bangladeshi friends. Can I put it to the rest of the Muslim community here? You should have done the same thing. You must all live next door to what you might call white English Christians, you know, Catholics, Protestants, whatever. You, you, you should have invited them along. I mean, they're not going to bite you off and they're not going to shout at you. They just like to mix with you from time to time. Yes. I've, I've always been lucky. I've always been lucky. I've either had good invitations from Muslims and, well, any other Asian community for that matter. And I've always been welcome. And I've always forced my own way in when I wasn't made welcome. So I was made welcome. <laughs> and you've got to do the same thing with yeah. us. It's, it's no good just sort of um, saying good morning, polite, as you pass by. You, you, you haven't got to walk up to and start preaching Islam and, 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 and Muslim beliefs, but you just got to be friendly with them and invite them. And that's what happens. And then bit by bit, they get wore down. I mean, I'm going to say that even within my own family, I've still got racial problems with my parents because of my attitude and relations towards foreigners. But the other thing I'd say, I mean, it's a bit flippant to say this, I always keep telling my Bangladeshi friends with the takeaways and the restaurants, when are you going to change that sign outside that says Indian? You know, all these Indian restaurants are run by Bangladeshis and Pakistanis, there ain't many Indians, there ain't many Sikhs, and there ain't many sort of Hindus running these Indian restaurants. So change the sign, put Bangladeshi or Pakistani over the top, and you might sort of start to integrate a bit better. Um, that's just very quickly reply, um, answer Pickler, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that you said that, that those comments are exactly what we as IMC Northeast, as the Muslim community in the Northeast, those who are active and involved in doing these type of programs, it's exactly what we are telling and encouraging people to do. You know, we, we talked, I mean, just following on from the other question, what is there to fear about the Quran? And it links in with exactly what you just said there. This is, ex this is the same point that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he represents the Qur'an, on showing that humanistic element to Islam, showing that what Islam really truly stands for, that it is not, nothing to fear, and in fact through our good manners, our engagement, through our, like you rightly mentioned, not just saying hello and goodbye and how are you doing, but actually engaging positively. And it comes back to the point that I always make about community cohesion. And this is a word that has been bounced about since really the Bradford Burnley riots. And that's when it became sort of a buzzword. And I asked, when I did a talk once to the YJB, and I asked, there was a largely non-Muslim white audience, community cohesion, what does it mean? And a lot of people understand community cohesion to be a one-way thing, because all this seems to be like that when it comes to policies and things like that. But community cohesion is actually a two-way process not from minority ethnic groups to the white community and not from the white community only to the minority ethnic groups but it's a two-way process and one of the things that we try to do with IBC Northeast is I guess humanize Islam through that direct engagement and it's exactly what you said so um, really what is there to fear about the Quran? well nothing because you've just summarized a lot of what the Quran teaches Thank you. Are there any more questions? Oh, sorry, um, Alistair wants to do that. Yes, one's a chance. Just to say that uh, Christians and Muslims, we share so many issues. This question of how people perceive Muslim people, the inaccurate perceptions. I was sat with a group of Christians a fortnight ago, and they were saying it's as if people who are not Christians perceive them as strange creatures with horns who go to church on a Sunday when, when there's a kind of misunderstanding of what Christians are. It may be more extreme in some cases for, for Muslim people, but I think there's this misperception that's around. The other thing is that 
I was intrigued the thought of the English parish church kind of planted in Pakistan. And of course, there was a major cultural mistake made by Christian missionaries uh, who mixed up religion and culture. There's the heart of the religion and there's stuff that's just whether you're Bangladeshi or Punjabi or, or whatever, or, or Scottish or English. And in, in both of our religions, we seem to get mixed up at times between religion and culture. Culture is something that is variable. Religion is about the heart of things. So there's so much that we do share. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, as a non-Muslim, I was just wondering if Muslims don't get heartily sick of having to defend their faith all the time, conflict with another religion that has to constantly try and engage and try and apologise for what they do and what they are. I was very surprised to hear Mr. Green um, almost empathising with, with people who are scared of finding a strange type of building in their town. Why not embrace the, the, the alien? Why not think, what a beautiful building? I, I don't understand this, this need to apologise all the time for, your, for yourself and for your religion. Um, can you explain that? Yeah, you put me on the spot there. Um, I, I tell you what, I tell you, you see, I think. Um, I don't disagree with Laura, tis Laura, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't think, I don't think we are naturally racist. I believe, we believe anyway as a point of faith, human beings are born naturally good. That's what we believe. That's one of the differences between, well I'm not going to go into that, but we believe that every child is born good and pure. It's only their environment that takes them away from that. So we believe that naturally we're connected to God, naturally we're inclined to be good, naturally we're inclined to... And that's why you see, when you see little kids together, they're colorblind. You hear this? The little, when you see kids together, they're colorblind. Right? They, are, they don't see different colors. Right? They don't look at... They don't, that does, that's something that comes later. But, okay, we can't dismiss culture. We can't dismiss the importance of culture. We can't, we can't simply, um, I, I just don't think it's realistic. It's like, it's, you know, saying, well, just enjoy it. It's like saying, just don't do drugs, just say no, right? Well, it sounds like a good slogan, but does that really deal with, you know, the issue at hand, yeah? So, you see, my view about culture, my actual, view about culture on a very basic level yeah, is that culture develops in a response to your environment right so if you look at the buildings let's just take an example if you look at the buildings maybe not modern buildings but if you look at the buildings a hundred years old right almost definitely the style of the building right the rock that the, the, the bricks that are used the stones that are used yeah even depending where you are, the thickness of the walls, the angle of the roof, is a response to the environment, right? So you'll find that Swiss chalets look like that for a reason, okay? So, and that's also to do with how we interact and various other things, right? And that's a very important part of how, what makes a human being what they are. It's identifying, it's belonging to a community, right? Okay? And... That culture takes time and energy to build up and to maintain. And it's, you know, sometimes, sometimes you can say, okay, that cultural practice is bad. That's not a good thing. But a lot of the time, culture is worthy. It's a good thing, right? There are a lot of good things about British culture, right? Being polite, that's British culture, right? Being on time, that's British culture. You know, there's certain things that are intrinsic in our behavior in Britain. There are good things, and we could think of many others, right? Cues. Huh? 
making cues. Yeah, making cues. Anyone who's been to Egypt or any other, so many other countries, you see the value of queuing, right? So, I mean, British, they love queuing so much. If you see a queue, you join it, even if you don't have to, right? But, I mean, the point is there are a lot of good things about British culture. Now, this is the point, is that all I'm trying to say to Muslims is you need to think about that, right? I'm saying you yourself as a Muslim do not like that church looking like it's come from England in the middle of your village. That's my point. But if you, honestly, if I ask them, they will say, yes, we don't like that. So isn't it a basic, isn't it? A basic rule. What's the what's the most uh, the basic moral rule? The basic moral law. What is the basic moral law? Who can tell me? The law. It's very simple. There's one law upon which all morals are built. What is it? What's the basic moral law? Huh? Yeah. And how is that translated? It's love your neighbour. Yeah, I'm not, not, love your neighbor is good, yeah. It's do unto others as you would have them do to you. Treat other people the way you like to be treated. It is empathy, what you said, yeah. That's all, that's my point, right? Muslims, at the end of the day, we, do, we need to think about the culture of this country. We need to think about the people of this country, right? We need to understand how they perceive us, how they think about us, right? And you see, if, if you want me to be frank and talk about really what's going on with Muslims, I'm go I'll be honest, yeah? I'll be honest. It's not nice. If I tell you, it's not nice, right? Why, I, I said, okay, why do they build mosques like that? I'm sorry to say the reality is, is cultural imperialism. A lot of it is cultural imperialism. They feel proud that the British ruled us for 300 years. Now we're going to come and we're going to stick our mosque here. And that's, it's, I'm sorry to say it's almost a tap of revenge tactic. Yeah? It's not nice, is it, what I'm saying? Yeah? But if you're honest and you look at the Muslims, for a lot of them, that's what it's like. Yeah? They get really happy. We've taken over a church. Yeah, a church has become a mosque now. Yes, Allah, you know, it's like, but there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is 300 years of, you know, British imperialism, right? And I mean, I know that's simplistic, but that's part of the reason. I don't think that's a good motivation. I don't think that's how you should behave. Yeah? So the reasons for those things are perhaps not because we want to do something beautiful and this and that. So I believe that we as Muslims should be culturally sensitive, it's very important. That's my personal opinion, but you're, you know, obviously you're quite entitled to differ. That's my theory, thinking about it. Yeah. Again, these parallels, our friend here uh, said, said well, you seem to imply that you were apologizing. I was just thinking, if, if, if I went to Christian friends in India and apologize for the vast Anglican Cathedral in Branchy, India, which I know quite well, which looks like Victorian England in a way, they would probably say to me, yeah, we're Indian people, we've had this for many generations, please don't apologize. Uh, so they are in Branchy, India, living alongside uh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, uh, and as live and let live. But I think I would also say that English people yeah. need to adjust to different cultures and different architecture. It's give and take both ways and there needs to be sensitivity both sides. As you said just now, do to the other do to others as you expect to do to you. I just uh, just quickly one final thing. It's very interesting if you look at some pictures of ancient mosques in China. Ancient mosques in China. Yeah, you'll never know that they're mosques. It, it looks just like China. I mean, it just looks like a Chinese pagoda. Yeah, but it's still a mosque. And anyway, I just thought that was really interesting. I, I thought it was. I don't. Can I ask them one, one <laughs> very interesting question? Should the British politicians who recently visited China should okay. they have worn poppies or not? The Chinese didn't want them to because it reminded Chinese people, they said, of the Opium War. Yeah. So well, that's a good big question. I don't know what the answer is. Mm. Um, 
I'm not sure at all, but it's a big question. Who needs to be sensitive to who? I think we should all be as sensitive as possible. And we should have lots of love and give each other a hug. That would be good. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. And there's one last point. Yeah, sorry, I, I just um, wanted just to hide the side of the interview with my friend. Um, I'm not sure whether it's, and I will be very rude for my boards to get hold of this one day. And I'm not sure that it's a conscious, like, imperial thing of, of kind of following the design of other mosques in other part of the, the world. I think it's sometimes just a natural thing. You know, you follow maybe a design that you know and a design that, you know, in your culture you find of. And whether people accept it or not is a... Um, it's, it's really, really complex, and it's down the psychological issues of the person. Like, are they in a time um, and a place in their life to embrace diversity? And I don't think, it, I think if you're really unhappy and if, if you have lots of complex things going on in your life, something that's strange, something that's alien, you're not going to accept it. You're just, you know, you're going to be quite, um, you're going to be quite resentful of it. You know, you're breaking down my culture. And my culture is something that I'm proud of. And, and for somebody to have an alternative to that, you know, to accept and to be free with different kind of architecture, different foods in their home place, is to be in a kind of, in a, I don't know if sound cliche, but in a kind of happy place and a comfortable, money-wise, in a comfortable position yourself. So I think it's a very, very complex issue to say, well, you know, everyone should just accept it. Some people find it really difficult to accept diversity, and it's about questioning them all why.